Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to see you here this morning. We're going to begin uh, by singing. It's a sovereign grace arrangement. So Bob Coughlin, I believe, is involved with that. It's uh, all creatures of our God and King, and it's a great and wonderful call to worship. So if you would, stand with us, and let's sing this together. Here we go. Three, four. This morning, why don't you find a good dozen or so, shake some hands, and welcome each other this morning. It's time.
Morning, Dr. Bob. All right, thanks everybody for showing up. Um, some of you that are not enlightened may not know what the significance of today is. This, this day, a true miracle was born. The lovely and talented Sandra Mobley. So, a rousing rendition of Happy Birthday. Ready? One and a two and a... We got uh, here, we got, well, let's do this first. Kimberly. You want to come up here or what? <laughs> She's difficult to live with, isn't she? <laughs> Kim wants to talk about VBS. Well, Lynn asked um, Asher and I to share about our experience, and of course, you only see me, <laughs> Asher. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so um, just a little bit about my experience with working at Vacation Bible School last summer. Um, it was just a joy to um, form relationships, not only with the little preschoolers that I was teaching, um, but also the fellowship with um, our brothers and sisters in Christ who help, um, who helped. It was just so fun getting to know them better and just the um, every day seeing the smiling faces and um, praying for the impact that um, we can have on these um, children. Um, so anyway, if you're interested in helping with Vacation Bible School, you can see Lynn Moline. <laughs> So that was it. Okay. All right. We got uh, the Iron Sharpens Iron Men's Conference uh, this weekend, Friday and Saturday, the 12th and 13th. You can still register online at isiconference.com. And we can, you can sign up in the lobby if you're interested in carpooling. Men Can Cook Competition, Saturday, May 20th at 530 Meet us here for your Men Can Cook competition. This year, our men will compete in the main dish category. So bring any main dish your heart desires, and the ladies will bring sides and desserts. And it's for all ages. Invite a friend and get ready for a good, friendly competition, and we're going to play bingo. Right? That ought to be rousing. Vague, huh? Bingo. Okay, Vacation Bible School, as Kim already uh, so eloquently uh, talked about, is going to be the 12th through the 16th from 9 a.m. to noon. And it's going to be a fun-filled week of kingdom activities for ages 4 to entering 7th grade. If you'd like to learn more, uh, stick around after church today. There's going to be lunch and a meeting about it, and you can learn everything that you want to know. But we're hoping that we can really impact the, uh, the local area Perhaps you saw the, the sign out front. We really want to get kids involved. The Alpha PHC Baby Bottle Blast in the lobby is a basket of plastic baby bottles from Alpha. And uh, so fill up the bottle with spare change, cash, check, and uh, they'll take it to Alpha by Mother's Day. Um, just save those babies. Connection cards, we want to hear from you if you got a prayer request or some sort of need or a change of address, all that, just fill out the connection card and seat in front of you and put it in the box in the back. And then want to join the app. Want to check the calendar, give, connect, request prayer, all in one place. Download the Church Center app from your smartphone's app store, and you can do all that online. Anything else burning in anybody's hearts? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for today, for your many blessings, uh, for the birth of my wife, 
what a blessing she has been for 36 years. Um, just bless this church. Bring people here. Uh, bring people that want to know you. Uh, just let us be uh, the, the source that they're seeking uh, to find out about you. Um, just, just give us the people to talk to. We're just called to, to tell the story, tell our, our, our experiences. It's up to you for the results, and we, th we thank you that you're going to bring results in these troubled times. Just bless our country, bless our church, bless our state, um, just bless our efforts. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we continue to worship this morning, we're going to sing a few songs about um, just the wonderment, really, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, our first song here will be, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, and it touches on um, just that, that one great lyric of prone to wonder, prone to leave the God I love. Right? We feel that, and yet um, Christ holds us secure. And we see at the cross the, just the wonderment, right, of God's justice and his love for, for us and the value that he places upon us with, with what Christ paid, what Christ endured. And so if you're going through just the difficult time today or you're questioning or wondering or, or whatever it might be, direct your eyes to Christ. Uh, be satisfied and fulfilled and, and not just that we're saved and we're saved eternally, but that we get to live this life to proclaim him. And to show him and demonstrate him to others. So as we sing these songs, I just encourage you to direct your attention to him and praise him for the work he's doing and his faithfulness to it. And clearly it's powerfully demonstrated at the cross of Calvary. So if you would stand with us and let's sing together. Come thou fount of every blessing. <laughs>
Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. This morning I'll be reading from Psalm 61. So I encourage you to grab your Bibles, turn to Psalm 61. You didn't bring your Bible. There's one. There should be one close to you in the seat in front of you, under the seat in front of you. <clears throat> psalm 61, a psalm of David, and David says this, Hear my cry, O God, give heed to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a refuge for me, a tower of strength against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. For you have heard my vows, O God. You have given me the inheritance of those who fear your name. You will prolong the king's life. His years will be as many generations. He will abide before God forever. Appoint loving kindness and truth that they may preserve him. So I will sing praise to your name forever. That I may pay my vows day by day. Amen. Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated this morning. And as we continue in worship, we always want to take time to go to the Lord as a congregation. So if you would, bow your heads, your hearts with me. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us. This day, this time, Lord, you've given us life and breath that we might assemble in the name of our Lord and our Savior who paid it all, dealt with all our sin, Calvary. So Lord, we bow our heads in reverence and in worship to you. And we praise you, Lord, for who you are. We know that you alone are worthy. You are glorious. Lord, in your splendor, in your majesty, you unto yourself deserve all the worship of a lifetime, and yet all the worship we can muster in a lifetime would fail to compare how great and mighty you are. Lord, we acknowledge that you are true to your word. You are the God who is ever-present. You are almighty over everything, for you are the one who has created everything. You've set everything in its place. Your grace to us, Lord, so powerfully demonstrated at Calvary, is amazing. Your mercies to us today, Lord, they are new. 
which with humility, Lord, we say thank you. Lord, just as David proclaims in this psalm that you are accessible, you will hear him. Even the faintness of his heart, Lord, you are accessible to us. Lord, you give heed to our prayers. There is truly no one like you. Father, your word teaches us that everyone, everyone who repents, who believes on Christ, who confesses Jesus, you will receive them. Lord, what great hope you give to all of us. What, what a profound and mighty love that Calvary demonstrates. Lord, thank you. Father, we know that it took Jesus, it took someone who could live perfectly under the law to fulfill the law, to bear our sins at Calvary. So Lord, we know that uh, as we come to you in the name of Jesus, we have confessed, we have repented, and yet, Lord, we know that there is remaining sin that we struggle with that often wins the day. And so, Lord, we take time as a congregation before you to simply confess that sin. We acknowledge that it breaks fellowship with you, that separates us from you. Lord, we know that we are declared uh, righteous and we are held in Christ eternally, Lord, but our communion with you is broken. We ask that you would forgive us. Lord, often our pride and desiring our own way, Lord, the, the heart is re rebellious often against you and your truth, what it teaches. So, Father, we ask again for forgiveness. Please cleanse us. We do ask that the Holy Spirit would continue to reveal in us areas of our lives where maybe we've justified sin, hidden sin. Lord, bring it to light that we would confess it, we would repent of it. And Lord, I, I just simply plead that if our hearts this day, this moment are faint, if our hearts, Lord, today are, are weak, then like David, Lord, lead us to the rock that is higher than us. I pray for us today, Lord, that if we are struggling, that you would be a refuge, a real refuge to us and a tower of strength against our enemies. Lord, appoint over us <clears throat> your loving kindness and your truth, that we would be preserved, Lord, in your truth. We would know it and cling to it. Father, we thank you. We thank you that because of Jesus Christ, we too, like David, will dwell with you forever. Thank you, Lord, for the indwelling of your spirit that renews us and refreshes us, it encourages us, it strengthens us. Thank you, Lord, for the calling that you've that it, you've placed on each and every one of us, that you've called us first by our names to believe on Jesus, that you set those good works in front of us that we might do, Lord, for your glory. So, Father, with this confidence that you're at work, you're true to your word, we pray for your church. We know you love your church. You have spilled precious blood for your church. Those who confess Christ and believe on Christ and follow and submit to his lordship. Lord, we pray that today your church, we, Lord, included with that, would profess and live the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, let us be a light that shines. Let the, uh, the seriousness, Lord, of, of sin be exposed that the power of Christ would be demonstrated. Let us see those in juxtaposition, Lord, the misery of sin and yet the blessing and the forgiveness at Calvary in Christ. So, Lord, we pray the gospel be proclaimed and preached today. We pray, Lord, for those around this globe who are suffering for the name of Jesus, who are suffering for the gospel and sharing the gospel. We pray, Lord, protection and comfort for them. We think of our missionaries, Lord, those who have said, I'm, I'm going abroad to proclaim the name of Jesus. We ask for protection over them. We ask, Lord, you make provision for them. And Lord, we see in our own nation the, the, the need for missionaries, for your church to rise up. Well, we pray for our presidents and our nation and our state, and we see, Lord, all the, the unrest and the wickedness. We see, Lord, the confusion we see the lack of justice and, and the praising of wickedness. Lord, we uh, desire that there would be a revival and awakening, Lord, through your church to speak truth to these areas. Uh, we pray against the unrest that we see, and Lord, that you would empower us uh, to do what we can. We pray for our first responders who stand in the gap. 
who place their lives on the line. We ask for safety over them and protection. Uh, we pray for safety in our communities and safety in our schools. But Lord, we pray against uh, the critical race theory that's so adamant and the confusion, Lord, the, the sexual revolution that is happening in our nation. Lord, we pray against this evilness and this wickedness and that truth, Lord, your truth uh, would come to bear. Uh, bring it to light. Lord, your word uh, brings such tremendous value for we know how we are created and we see over and over again the greatest need is to be reconciled to our Creator. God, let your church proclaim the gospel. We pray for us this morning at Faith Community Bible Church that our leadership, our ministries would be committed to teaching your word, to implanting your word, Lord, and to seeing us live out your word. We pray for those this morning who are going through a difficult time in need of healing. God, we ask your mercy, your power your hand of healing, physical, spiritual, Lord, the different areas of our lives. We look to you. We call upon you. We expect, Father, great things because you are great. And yet we rest, Lord, in your sovereignty. We rest in how our Savior has prayed, not our will, your will. We trust in you. But, Lord, we ask in obedience and in faith you would move we pray, Lord, that all our efforts regarding outreach and VBS, as we make plans, as we labor to impact the community, Lord, and families through children, that you would protect us, you would guide us, that we would continue to be a light, Lord, and, and uh, be used of you to impart your truth. So we pray against the evil one and his ways. Lord, guide us and lead us what you'd have us to do. Father, we pray over the offering as well this morning, those prepared to give online or on the box. May it be done as an act of worship. Lord, all we have is from you. You are the one who is our provider. You are the one who is our refuge and our strength. So Lord, as an act of worship, bless the offering today. May it be used for the furtherance of your kingdom and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you. We pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Well, this time I'd like to dismiss the children of the Children's Church. And uh, if you would turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, not 2 Corinthians, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as you're turning there, I do want to take a moment. One of the things that I've been discussing with Lynn, and uh, earlier this week she had this wonderful idea um, and if you don't if you don't like the idea, then it's then it's my idea, right? Um, but I do want to give her credit if you think it's a great idea. Uh, the kids throughout VBS will be memorizing scripture, right? And so there is a list of scriptures out in the foyer. I'm going to challenge uh, you adults, great memory abilities, right, to also memorize those scriptures. One of the things we want to sit in front of you. It, you know, outreach is not simply a few people who work in the children's ministry. VBS involves all of us, right? We need teachers and those to, to lead and to serve in the back and different games. And, not, of course, I know not everyone can be a part of that. But one way that we can be together, right, in this outreach is to memorize those scriptures. So what we want to do is there is, I believe, I don't know if it's out there, Lynn, did you put up the crest out there or not? I don't know if there's a crest. What we're going to do is as you learn and memorize those scriptures, we're not, going to, we're not going to hold you accountable, right? We're not going to like track you down and make sure if you said the right way and, and uh, um, you know, if you said, nope, there was a comma there, you paused too long, we're going to, you know, right? We're not going to do that, um, but we just simply ask, share those with someone you love, a sibling, a friend, uh, a spouse, and then as you, as you complete those, those, we just want to set this, this thing is a great challenge. As you finish those and you've set them to someone, uh, and they said, yep, you said it. We want you to sign your name to that crest out on the back. We'd love to see everyone's name. Just grab hold of these scriptures. Um, because we too, right, we're going to teach these kids the power of God's word. I, I think we believe in the power of God's word too. So if you take up that challenge, I encourage you to do that. The list of scriptures will be out there. Um, and if kids can do it, by all means, right? I better be careful. I have a hard time memorizing stuff. So that's going to be a challenge for me. All right, well, this morning, uh, I had you turn to 1 Corinthians. I have this, this uh, moment in uh, looking at 2 Corinthians last week, and Paul is 
Uh, if you remember that passage, Paul is um, he's comparing himself, right? He's allowing himself. He has this problem in the Corinthian church. Uh, they have uh, bought in to this idea of these false teachers who can boast big things, right? Uh, that's what's happening in the church. You know, it's kind of how the church is rolling, if you will, right? The colloquial, you know, that's how they roll. That's what's going on. And so Paul in that passage says, okay, if that's what's happening, then I'm going to have to put my, my voice in there too because they are imbibing with these false teachers. This church is buying in to what they are espousing and they are attaching works to salvation amongst other things. All right, there's a lot of accusations against Paul. And so Paul is dealing with this church and the passage that follows what we looked at last week goes into the list of what Paul um, is going to suffer, or has suffered, right? He lists them out. How he was uh, whipped and beat and stoned and, and shipwrecked and bit by a snake. I mean, he's going to list those things. And then as I was preaching that message last week, I had this, this thought of just, you know, this is, this is, this is somebody who's, who believes the gospel, I mean, I don't know if, if you and I would be willing to go what he's gone through, but we know throughout history, many have given their lives, right, through, through the history of the Bible. And of course, throughout our own history, we see uh, many who have, have laid down their lives. Um, different se- seasons, right, in different areas around the globe, we have seen those who will suffer for Jesus. And the question that came to me as I was preaching that is simply, what, are, what, are, what am I? What are you willing to suffer for Christ. And so before we get into that passage in 2 Corinthians, as Paul begins to just unfold that, right? He's not like the false teachers. They should have known that, right? They should have known that. But he goes into this element of listing what he has endured. And so before we get to that passage, I thought it would be good to say, well, let's go back. And we know Paul has preached Christ and him crucified, but in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he gives us this confessional statement. Here's the gospel. I simply title this gospel facts, right? Gospel facts. We'll look at the first two verses of 1 Corinthians 15 this morning. I believe this is important. I've said this many times, but I think the church today is has reduced, right, the, the message down to just pray a prayer and you're good, right? We, there's no discipleship or follow through or what does it mean to live the life? What does it mean to pick up a cross? Uh, Jesus was very clear uh, in uh, Matthew 16, right? I mean, he tells us um, after he rebukes Peter, right, the cost, here it is. If anyone's going to follow after me, uh, the rebuking of Peter is there saying he won't die, right? But he goes into the cost of discipleship. If you are here this morning, you're saying Christ is your Savior, well, then you too have said, you know what, I'm going to pick up that cross. And Jesus is saying, come and die with me. That's, that's what he's saying. Come follow me, right? And, and they understood that in that context. Today, I think we've just kind of lost a lot of that. There was a story of, of a man who was in his home, and he had his headphones on. He's listening to music. I don't know if you do that. My youngest son likes to do that, and we yell at him. And then there's times where I'm like, I think he heard us, but he's playing like, oh, I didn't hear you, you know. This man was in his house, and he's, he's walking around listening to his music, and he doesn't know that the upstairs room, there had been an electrical fire had started, and his house is on fire, and he doesn't smell the smoke, doesn't pay attention to the smoke, and it's not until the alarm company actually calls his phone, right, that he picks up the phone, because he's listening to music on his phone with his headphones, you know how people do today. Some of you know that. Some of you are like, what are you, I don't even know what you're talking about, right, but... They call him and say, do you know, realize your house is on fire? And he goes, why? If they didn't call me, I would never would have No, At some point, we'd imagine he would know. It kind of gets a little hot, so he would figure something out, right? But I think that story kind of grabs hold of, of what is happening in American Christianity. It's not everywhere, of course, but there are those who are simply not seeing the signs. We are taking the gospel and reducing it down to an accessory. It's my get-out-of-jail card, right? I've got it. I prayed once, tuck that in my pant pocket, I'm good. And Paul has some very serious, in this passage, we'll read it here in a moment, these verses, he talks about it, unless you've believed in vain, it is possible at the very beginning of, of setting the gospel straight, Paul says, unless, right, you've you've believed in vain. There's a real reality that there are many who have prayed, simply prayed a prayer, thought they got their get out of of, uh, a jail card and think they're okay, when reality is saying you haven't haven't believed. 
You really haven't come to know Christ. And so you can see that what Paul, if there's confusion around the gospel and you have false teachers that are coming in and, and just mudding up the waters, well, you can imagine, right, his, his desire. We've got to get in there. The church is on fire, right? The church is on fire, and they, they aren't smelling the smoke. They're not seeing the problems. They're imbibing what false teachers are saying. They are boasting about a bunch of different stuff, and they think this is, this is good. This is where it's at. We're, we're the cool, hip church. Right? We've got the, the new stuff. We're, we're in it. And the Corinthians right, can't afford that. Eternally, they can't afford that. Us, you and I, we cannot afford that. I don't know about you, but when I stand before my Creator, I am going to plead the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to plead my, my, my mediator. Right? I'm going to plead the one who has stood in the gap, who has paid for my sins. I'm not going to stand there and go, I'm pretty good. I have some works. We can't afford that. So this is the seriousness. And this, we, as we look at this again, and I know it's been a couple of years since we've looked at this passage, but as we look at this again, we begin to see What's driving Paul? What should be driving us? Our life, as James says, is just a vapor. We're here for the, it compared to eternity. So while we're here, we need to be shining a light, pointing to Christ. Because the reality is there are many going into perdition right without Jesus. There are many who are going who will hear the words that Jesus said, yeah, I never knew you those right the 10 church 10 bible studies those don't save you we don't want to be those who believed in vain so the first two verses of first corinthians 15 says this now i make known to you brethren the gospel which i preach to you which also you received in which also you stand by which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. I'm going to continue reading through verse 11, but we'll, we're going to look at those first two, but let's continue. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I preached, excuse me, I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me did not prove vain. You see the connection. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. As we look at this, as we begin to look at this whole passage, in these first two verses, let's take a moment and ask that God's Spirit would instruct us. Father, we, we thank you for the time again you've given to us. And we would come with humility and reverence. And it is our desire to under, understand your word rightly. Especially the gospel, Lord, but all of it rightly. We, so we pray that your Spirit would open it up to us and teach us. That we would see correctly and not just... Um, not just, Lord, believing, but that we would see the... The, the verbs, the actions, and, and what's happening in our lives. Uh, so, Lord, instruct us and, and grow us, I pray, through this time. Get me out of the way, Lord, that we, we would receive what you have for us, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in this passage, Paul, we know that he's, he's been receiving correspondence. Chapter 7, verse 1 hints at this. Things that they have written to Paul, he says in chapter 7, verse 1, now concerning the things about which you wrote, right? We know there's other letters that they have exchanged. Some believe there's a total of five scholars believe that. We have sovereignly recorded for us or kept for us 
uh, these two letters. And in this passage, Paul has been dealing with different things that they have corresponded with him about. And in this passage, he is beginning with the gospel to deal with uh, some in the church who are questioning the resurrection. There are some there who are simply denying the resurrection. Uh, he says in verse 12, Now if Christ is preached that he has been ra uh, raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? Uh, we see right here Paul is attaching specific things that the Scriptures teach about Jesus that we are to, to believe and implement into our lives. He says his own life, right? Going to the sufferings of the second letter, he has not believed in vain. There is life change, right? There are those in the church who are saying, let's neglect or, or dismiss this idea because we cannot believe it, or we think it's too crazy, or it doesn't make sense to me. Let's just get rid of the resurrection. And Paul is saying, you get rid of the resurrection, you've gotten rid of Jesus. That's the saying of Throwing out the baby with the bathwater, right? Is that the idea? Right? That's what they're doing. They're getting rid of the whole thing. So he's going to begin by saying, once this, I preach this gospel to you. And we know from the first letter, it's Christ and him crucified. And Paul becomes in this passage, he just tells us in a confessional statement, this is what it is. This is the truth of it. Jesus died according to the scriptures. He was buried according to the scriptures. He rose. So we want to understand this, right? We want to come to this, and as we see in Paul's life, as we see in his teaching with the Corinthians, these are not mere um, fables. It's not mysticism. It's, it's not something like a good story that's just, you know, just to show us how to live our lives. I've said this before, and there are many in the pulpits of, a, of the Lord's church today now, maybe we wouldn't say it's the Lord's church. Those who, who claim to be a church uh, who don't even believe that Christ actually physically came, let alone rose. They believe that this is just a story to help motivate us to live a life, a good life. So there's nothing new under the sun. Paul is dealing with false teachers in the context of the church. We're going to have that. The Bible writes from the assumption there's going to be false teachers. And here the damage is the reality that when you think at the end of your life you're going to enter into heaven and you hear the words, I never knew you, man, that is, that is a crying shame. Because in your life and in the church you were attending, yeah, let's go back to that metaphor, the building was on fire, you weren't smelling the smoke. You believed in vain. For Paul, this isn't a mere game. It's not something that is simply, hey, this is what we do on Sunday. No, it is the Lord's Day. We assemble to worship. Why? Because there are, there are gospel facts, gospel realities, capital T truth, objective outside of us. And he will suffer for this. Our heroes of the faith suffered for this. Countless missionaries who have given their lives suffer for this. Why? Because they believe something about the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The two things I have for you this morning. Uh, this gospel facts, the first thing, as the first part of verse uh, 1, I just simply say it's, it's a fact that the gospel does not change. Paul says, now I make known to you, brethren, right? Brothers, brothers and brethren means brothers, sisters, fellow believers. He says, the gospel which I preach to you, I make it known to my, right, those professing Christ, the gospel. It is the Christian foundation. Without the gospel, we have no Christianity. We have no Christ. We have nothing. We have no reason in which to assemble. Uh, it's always mind-boggling to me that there are people who don't believe that Jesus actually came, he actually rose, and yet they still assemble on Sunday. Like, I don't, I don't understand that. Like, that's the benefit when they're the, the empty, right? They have nothing. So for us, we want to come and say, well, if the gospel doesn't change, well, what is it? And this is foundational, right? We call it, the Bible calls it the good news. Why is it the good news? Because you and I have a serious problem, right? We've got a major problem. 
You and I are born into sin, right? When Adam ate that fruit, I make that joke, and when we get to heaven, we'll punch him, but um, he ate the fruit. He was the covenant head. When he ate it, we ate it. We are just as guilty as him. And we see even back then the grace of God expelling them from the garden. Because if they ate, fruit became immortal, right? There would never be any redemption. From the very beginning, we see the heart of God in redemption. So you and I have this problem, and the other side of that problem is that God demands perfection. God is holy, and he is just. God cannot overlook sin. His holiness demands that. He is just. His justice, his justice excuse me, demands this. He cannot be a holy, just God if he overlooks you got you side of the congregation, you look all right, come on in, you guys, well, good luck with that, right? He can't do that. He won't do that. His justice demands perfection. So here's our problem. Paul has told them in the second letter, chapter 5, verse 10, that we will stand before the throne room of God, each of us to give an account of our actions, of our lives, and we'll stand there based on our own righteousness or lack thereof, or the righteousness of another. This is why we call this the good news. Christ has stepped into this world factually. He's walked on this planet factually. He went, this is what Paul is saying, to the cross according to the scriptures factually. See, it's his perfect righteousness, his active obedience. And he does this not simply, right, for himself. I mean, there's there's no need for Christ to do this for himself, but he does this for the elect. He does this for every soul that repents of their sins and believes on him. So just as, right, we are born with fruit in our mouths, there's a picture for you, right? We can say like Paul, if you have repented and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you too can say, right, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Just as the the perfect act of obedience of Jesus is now imputed to you through that prayer, right, we can stand and say as if I have fulfilled the law. I don't know about you, but that's good news. Because there's no works on the planet you can do. You can't fix original sin. It took an alien righteousness, a righteousness outside of ourselves. This is the good news. Paul says, this is what I preach to you. Christ, him crucified. Uh, Spurgeon says this, the heart of the gospel is redemption. And the essence of redemption is the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. There is one who says, I love you. I will bear your penalty. It's a powerful and profound picture, Matthew 7, right? We don't have to turn there, where Jesus talks about the broad way, and many are on it, and the narrow gate. And at the narrow gate, right, why is it narrow? Because we come individualistically. We come and we make eye contact with Jesus. It is Jesus who, right, who makes eye contact with us. It is us who, who bow down and ask for forgiveness. It is Christ who picks us up, right, wraps us in his righteousness. It is the picture right, of the court of law. It is God declaring us just and then walking around the bench and coming down and taking his robe and wrapping you right, in that robe because now you're adopted into the family. It is that picture of what he is doing. And Paul is saying this, This is everything. This is why we suffer. And this is why we cannot let the church to to continue, going back to that metaphor, continue to burn. Right? Because the other alternative, if we're not going through the narrow gate, if we're not believing specifically what Jesus has taught us and says in his word, well, then the other option is the broad road. So for Paul, the gospel is something objective. It began in history, right? Outside of us, God so loved the world, Christ comes. And just as the Old Testament saints look forward to that day, New Testament saints, we look back to that day, this pivotal moment in all of history. For Paul, it is a fact. This is how he's writing. There's no wavering here. The gospel, when we come to believe, that's where it becomes subjective. 
It changes our lives. We receive the benefits. We receive the faith. We hear the word adoption becomes ours. And the only way, right, that we can receive these benefits of Christ's perfect life, his death, his resurrection is to come. Humility, repent of our sins, trust him alone. When we do that, we are declared just by God. The justice of God is, is not overlooked or subsided. It is met perfectly in Jesus. We are forgiven not, not some of our sins, but all of our sins. We are cleansed completely. We are adopted into the, to the family. We have a new name in glory. The old is gone. The new has come. And at that moment, we began a pilgrimage on this earth. We pick up a cross and we follow after Jesus because we want others to come and know, right, about this Lord and about this Savior. But Paul declares, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. It's the very same gospel. Paul hasn't changed the words. He hasn't made it less acceptable now or, or less uh, powerful or made it more, uh, he hasn't tapered it down or reduced it or diluted it in any way to make it more palatable for them. It's the same Christ crucified today in the church. What do we see, right? Let's make it easier and easier and easier for people to come. In reality, they haven't come to Christ. That's the, that's the real problem. And Paul here is not simply saying, hey, let me, let me remind you of Jesus. He's not actually doing that. He's saying, let me proclaim to you again. I don't want to just bring you back to Calvary. I want to, to begin over again. I want to proclaim this to your soul again. I want to declare it as if you've never heard it. That's, that's how he's writing this. I want to proclaim it as if you've never heard this before. And I want to make it known to you as if it's all brand new. That's how powerful the gospel is for Paul. I want you to come back to this. I'm going to go into this, and then we'll talk about the resurrection, because if the resurrection doesn't happen, none of this I'm writing right now even matters. You know, we have you know, many in the church who profess Christ. They come to a place in, in, of hardship or difficulty, and next thing you know, it's Christ isn't enough. Now, I don't want to ever downplay hardships or difficulties. I, too, am human. I understand them. It's at those times where I believe we need to be crying out and clinging to, not walking away or turning our back. Because Christ has come. I think there are many in the church today who are, who are in danger of what the Corinthians are going through. We're, we're, we're buying into other teachings. We're buying into other things that aren't actually scriptural. We've got to a place today where it's, right, I make that joke of, of, of blowing up the pastor in the car out in the parking lot, right? And actually, that's not a joke that really happened, but he, he lived. But um, allegedly, I don't know, maybe, you know, he did. But we think that's what brings him in. A pastor standing behind a pulpit saying, here's what the scriptures teach is not what people want but we see no no deviation in paul not only have i preached this to you and i'm writing you a letter i'm going to preach it to you again what does that say to our own souls and the need of the gospel there was a, a married couple had been married for quite a few years they were sitting on a couch together and the husband was reading this article and he, he started to read this out loud to his wife, it says that women use 30,000 words a day, where men only use 15,000. Wife, being very witty, replied, that's because we have to repeat everything to you. <laughs> to which the husband replied, what? Right? <laughs> Sometimes we need to hear it again, we need to hear it again, we need to hear it again. There are reasons. In my sermon here, I have a few reasons why, why we should hear the gospel again. What does it do for us? 
We should preach the gospel to ourselves every morning. Preach it, right? It should be heard on the, on the gospel on the Lord's Day especially, but it should be resonating in us. And what, what benefits do we get when the gospel's in front of us? Is One, the gospel calls us to worship and to give thanks. The Lord's Day should always be a day we look forward to throughout the week as I think about the difficulties that, that I might be walking through, but God who never leaves me never, nor forsakes me, and yet he has redeemed me. And as David says, he not only does he hear my prayers, he gives heed to them. The gospel says, man, I have right fellowship with God. I have right communion with God. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, 15, I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways singing the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, it leads us to giving thanks. The gospel reminds us, right, of our identity in Jesus. I'm not a child of the world, I'm a child of the king. I don't know about you, but sometimes we forget that, don't we? We can forget there must be some problem. I'm not worth the price he paid. Maybe we start believing the lie that someone has told us. We preach that gospel to our hearts. It clears away the, the fogginess, doesn't it? He has redeemed me. He's called my name. The gospel will sustain us. It roots our faith. It makes us fruitful. We're in the vine of Christ. There should be growth and maturity. There should be, right, the outworking of the gospel in us. Jude says in Jude 20 and 21, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of, excuse me, the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Building ourselves, holy faith, right, the work of the Spirit. The gospel sustains us. The gospel keeps us from sinning. It's the work, right, in us, guides us. Because he has so loved us, we love him, and because we love him, we don't want to sin against him. We'll struggle with that. We'll fail often, but our heart and our desire is to not to do those things, to turn and repent because we don't want to grieve him. This is what the gospel shows us. It frees us. There's no, no legalism. No, there's a desire. I want to be obedient. The gospel motivates us to good works. Jesus has overcome the world, and he says, I want you and placed you in it to be my light. And we know from Ephesians 2.10, there are good works that, the, that God our Father has placed in front of us. He wants us to live, right? To, to live and to do as he has called and commanded. The gospel also protects us from despair. If there's ever a moment where you're questioning the love of God for you, Please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation as it begins. And it ends with there is no separation. Those are the bookends to Romans chapter 8. If you're discouraged, open your Bible, read. There's nothing that will separate you from the love of God. The gospel tells us this. The gospel encourages those around us. Just as we live this life, we're more prone, right, to be loving and encouraging, supporting of others. The gospel battles our pride. We realize what it took to redeem us. We've come to Calvary. We see what Christ had to suffer through. Kills our pride. Lord, thank you. The gospel makes us mindful of eternity. Isn't that a good one? Jesus said, and I give, them eternal, I give eternal life to them. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. This is not our home. We are traveling through, and while we're here, and God has given us breath, let's grab as many souls as we can and point them to Jesus. And of course, the gospel shapes our worldview. What you think about God, what you think about Jesus, shows in your life. Your obedience to Jesus is a direct reflection to your understanding of the gospel. If you're struggling with obedience, if you're struggling in these areas, it doesn't mean you're wrong. It doesn't mean that there's not faith. It just simply means we need to come back to Calvary. Come back and see what Jesus has, has done for you. Be motivated by it. Let it shape your worldview. Let it shape who you are. Let it begin to exude from you. This is what the gospel does. Paul's saying these, these things never change. 
They're gospel facts. That's what he sets the tone. I'm going to proclaim this again to you. And of course, that's in the passage that follows. And then in my second point here this morning is simply this. It's a fact that the gospel is the only means of redemption. This is why we want to get this right. The second part of verse 1 into verse 2, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which you uh, also, excuse me, by which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. All the confusion going on in this church, you can see why Paul is saying that. You see, the gospel still redeems sinners. This same gospel that saved Paul is the gospel that saves us. It still works. It's amazing, you see it, right? You see it in the thing, the past tense. Uh, they received it. In the present tense, they stand on it, right? These verbs. And then they are being saved through it. It is an ongoing work. As we pick up that cross, we see the elements of Jesus and the gospel at work in us. Past, present, future. And I think this is what, and one of my favorite verses, you hear this in my prayers, you'll hear it when I speak of it, when I reference God's promises, this is a verse that's running in my head, is that when we see the, the Philippians 1, 6, for I'm confident of this thing, that he who began a good work in you, who, this work is salvation. The regenerating work of the Spirit placing faith in us, bringing us the gift of, of repentance. He began this in us. Those who are redeemed, right, are going to live a life. He's going to perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Your life is going to be changed because God is at work in you. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect this side of eternity. So if you think you're perfect today, just tuck that one away. You're not, right? So what are we to do? The gospel is, is true. It doesn't change. What are you and I to do? Well, number one, this is, there's some sub points here. You must receive. He says, this is the gospel you receive. Don't change it. Don't reduce it. Don't dilute it. He says, receive it, which means receive the true propositions, the information of the gospel of Jesus Christ. According to the scriptures, Paul will say this. According to what his word says, believe that. Receive it. Embrace it. It is true, it does not change. And build your life on it. He is the cornerstone. Next, he says, you need to stand in it. And the church today needs to take a stand. Put out the fire, right? There's my metaphor again, running with it. Put away the false teaching. Stand means to, to uh, firmly remain, continue steadfast. Right? Paul in Romans 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, right? The gospel, you're saved. He says, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into the, this grace in which we stand and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. Past tense, we have been justified. There's a moment the gavel has gone down. Present tense, we have peace right now. We are standing in the reality that I am right with God because of Jesus. Future tense, I look forward to the glory. We see it written, right? Paul as he says these things. There is a life that has been changed. We are picking up a cross. We are living for him. It begins when we're confident. We believe the facts of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stand firm. There was a story of a, of a boy who was reflecting back when he was a kid, and him and his dad had this, this wonderful dog. And the dog was very obedient, and they went to the gate. They were going to go to town this one day, and they came to the gate, and they told the dog to sit and to stay. They went to town, they came back, forgot about the dog till the evening, because they noticed the dog wasn't running around the house. They went back to the gate, and there that dog was sitting. Now, if you can train a dog like that, that's amazing. Come to my house, help me out, right? Obedience to the master. Stand, stand in the faith. So you are going to face opposition. Many of you are probably facing it now, maybe from family members, from coworkers. 
you're facing uh, today, social media, it's all around us, compromise, compromise, compromise. It will be easier on you if you compromise. That's the reality. But Paul, right, where's he going? He's going to suffer. All our heroes do what? They suffer. Why? Because the world does not want Christ. And while you're here, you're going to suffer. Christians will suffer. He's called us to this. In the midst of our suffering, our Savior is with us. Those three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I thought we only threw three in the fire. Who's this other guy, right? You're going to face opposition. There's going to be false teachers. There are going to be those, even sadly, within the church who are going to tell you, hey, yeah, you don't really need that. It's just grace. You've got your get-out-of-jail card. That's a Monopoly reference. Some of you don't know Monopoly. Maybe some of you young people may not, right? I didn't think about that, but you have that. You're good. Live your life how you want. The gospel demands Jesus is telling you, no, you, you live following me. That's, that's the gospel. The shed blood of Jesus cleansing us, calling us. We stand, we receive it, we stand, we follow after him. Because this is where he goes. By which also you are saved. See, back in this same letter in chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul told them, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We'll see you through to the end. We receive it. We stand in it. We move forward in the gospel. We show solidarity to Christ. His commands become important to us. Out of works? No. Out of love. He has set us free. He's delivered us from the bondage of sin. He has delivered us from the, the fire of hell. He loves us. Our response is loving obedience. This is what Paul is saying. The Corinthians, you received it. You stand in it. You're looking forward. And then he gives us that unless, unless you believed in vain. I mean, here's the, the, here's the warning, right? Here's the warning. I mean, Paul is explicit. In verse 2, he says, the word which I preached to you, he repeats it again, right? The gospel which I preached to you. We see that in verses 1 and 2. Uh, we see in one sense he's, he's positive and the other one is more of a, of a warning. Unless you believed in vain. See, today it's popular to, re, to reject the objective truth. As I mentioned earlier, many who don't believe that Jesus actually came, those would be people we would say are believing in vain. There are those within this congregation in, in uh, Corinth who are saying the, the resurrection didn't happen. They're believing in vain. That's what Paul is saying. You're not believing according to the scriptures. You're believing because what you think should and should not be. You have come to the Bible and said, I will be the judge of it. This is what I think is true and what is not true. You're believing in vain. That's the reality of it. That's why Paul is so explicit. Let me, let me list this out for you. Christ, right, he came. He died. He was buried. He rose according to the scriptures. We must never deviate from this. Because if we're believing in vain, Paul is saying you're not saved. Maybe our life reflects that we have questions about the gospel. Maybe it reflects that maybe we are believing in vain because we're not showing this solidarity or this, this the desire to, to proclaim Christ. We're more concerned about uh, getting out of jail free or ex escaping the flames, if you will. I think Paul is impressing upon us at church. There's so many breaths that God has given you on this planet. And what are you doing with them? And it's not to go around to prove ourselves that we're saved. He's simply saying, a saved person is going to do this. A saved person is going to receive. A saved person is going to stand. A saved person is going to proclaim. A saved person is going to have a life that has changed. They grow in their sanctification. They pick up 
their cross. They follow after Jesus. They trust them in the midst of trials and difficulty. They, they take the slap on the face when someone calls you a fool or someone says, right, he's foolish, as they've done to Paul. And Paul will have a list of things that I, that I don't know about you, don't even come close to enduring the type of suffering he has suffered for Jesus. And many of you can think of heroes, missionaries throughout time who have suffered for the name of Jesus. Those today who are suffering, why? Because they believe these facts and they will not deviate from them. And we know, brother or sister, we know there's only two spiritual families and they are warring. Paul assumes that those who confess Christ will remain faithful. That's all he's saying. He doesn't say that you're going to be perfect, right? That happens in glory. We're not going to be perfect. We're going to struggle with sin. We're going to war against sin. We're going to war against our flesh. We're going to be those who repent every day, but we're going to preach the gospel to ourselves and remind us that we are saved by the blood of Jesus. And because of that proclamation, I have, I have encouragement, I have courage, I have confidence. It'll make me to stand. When I know nothing else to do, as Paul will tell them in the, le- in the end of this chapter, stand firm. The gospel will, will, will allow me to stand firm and to let nothing move me. Because the gospel tells me that all my labor in the gospel is not in vain. Because the gospel is still saved. So we want to believe the right things about Jesus. We want to be aware of the gospel, understand this, why we have devotion time. The gospel is, is, is direct and simple. It is the, the substitu- substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. He came. He lived a sinless life. He, was, he suffered the miseries of this life. Born into a poor family, he understood hunger, pain. He was treated like a criminal, numbered amongst the criminals. And he suffered. And in that suffering, he brought about the redemption of all those who repent and believe. And those who do this, right, those, will, those who have repented and believed, to pick up the metaphor yet again, We'll notice if the church building's on fire, right? Not literally, but figuratively. They'll notice, they'll smell the smoke, they'll speak up, we'll stand. That is not the gospel I have received. If it's contrary to scripture, we'll make it known. It matters. Because your soul will spend eternity in one of two places. Let us not be distracted. Let us stand firm. The gospel does not change. It is the only means of redemption and it still works. As a church, let us resolve to say this, this is true, this is the gospel. Let it, the facts of the gospel, ready us, prepare us, maybe even now, to take a stand in the midst of suffering, in the midst of accusations. Remember, it's out of those accusations that others witness and see and say there must be something about this Jesus. If this person is willing to go through that, Paul is hoping the same. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that Christ has paid for us, not in part, but in whole. We thank you that, Lord, he has done something that we can never. We realize and, and acknowledge that Christ has come according to the scriptures. That he died upon that cross at Calvary according to the scriptures. That he was buried according to the scriptures. That he rose, overcoming the world according to the scriptures. That is our confession. And Father, I pray that you would um, grow this in us. Let the seeds and the truth of the gospel uh, be deeply rooted in us. I pray that the evil one would not come and steal or take away, that this seed would take just profound root in us. We are, Lord, the light that is to shine, to point others to Jesus. Lord, let us, first and foremost, be confident in it. Let us realize that we're saved, not in part, but in whole. 
that not some of our sins, but all of our sins are dealt with. You have loved us completely from head to toe and redeemed us accordingly. With that confidence, Lord, let us stand in the gospel that we received. Let us not deviate from it. Let us proclaim it. Let us live it out in front of others. Empower us with your spirit, Lord. We're going to face much opposition. We know the enemy is roaring like a lion, just seeks to devour and destroy. So, Lord, build us up firm in this confidence. And let all our labor, Lord, in you not be in vain. We thank you for that truth, that promise. Thank you for that reality. We pray all this to your purpose, for your kingdom, for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here this morning and you have questions regarding, again, what it means to follow, to believe on Christ, please come talk with me. If you have questions regarding uh, the, the sermon or um, other theological questions, if I can help you, I'd love to do that for you. If you, if you need just prayer, going through a hard time, um, I'll be available up here following the service. Love to pray with you. Uh, if there's other ways in which you want to call or set up a time of meeting to come in, my information's in the bulletin. Please uh, reach out. Um, also, just a, a quick reminder, the VBS meeting following the service, please stick around as we'll have that following the service. But as we close this morning, we're going to sing this song, God of Grace, um, because it is, right? He is. He is the God of Grace. Um, we've sung it before. It might be a little bit new, but it's just a simple uh, hymn-like chorus. Uh, that speaks to what he's done for us, that we can live in it. So if you would, stand with us, and let's sing this together as our benediction. you and keep you as you go.